So, carried. Thank you very much. Um, right, we come now to item number nine, and if I can ask uh, Marguerite Delbay and Warwick McNaughton to come to the table. Uh, we're looking at the terms of references uh, for uh, each of the committees. And just while they're being seated to explain, uh, every councillor got a copy of the terms of reference. Um, we got feedback back. Thank you for those that, um, that uh, did that. And then we've got council officers to go back to either adopt what you've recommended or explain why it might not be appropriate to adopt. And I think uh, where we've got to on this is that uh, people were generally accepting that the terms of reference were appropriate. Uh, but we did uh, thank officials for, for being painstaking and, and going back to members and, and having that discussion. So um, I'll, I'll put the recommendation just to uh, put it on the, uh, on the table, adopt the terms of reference and authorise the general manager to make uh, minor amendments. Do I, I second it to the deputy mayor. And Marguerite, uh, Marguerite, do you want to lead or Warwick? Good morning, Mr. Mayor and Councillors. So, um, first of all, apologies from Stephen Kempen, who did a lot of work on this. He's um, away sick, but I just really want to acknowledge the amount of work he's put on in, into this. Um, basically, the terms of reference uh, describe the remit of the, the committee's business and also list things like the membership and the, the quorum. So we hope they have um, captured all the decisions and discussions that have been made accurately. Um, we will add the portfolio description um, if the mayor asks um, us to do that once it's been discussed and, and agreed in terms of the wording. And we will add the membership of the panels once the recruitment process has, um, uh, has taken place. So. The rest is pretty much self-explanatory in terms of what is in the terms of reference. Warwick, anything you want to add to that? Okay, so we'll open up for questions. Questions from councillors. I know you've had one-to-one, -one, so you may have had your questions answered, but um, no questions. Any comments? Comments? Councillor Cooper. Sorry, uh, mic on? Oh, really? Uh, can, can we? Ah, oh, there you go. <laughs> it's resurrected oh, it's and then not. died. Yeah. Something happened. It, it, yeah. it rebooted itself. Um, just in terms of the numbers, um, the numbers reduced from last term, and I struggled to get a quorum sometimes, even with 11 people, and now there's nine. Um, I just wondered if there was any reason for that. Um, there is quite a workload, and... You know, as long as people will take it seriously, I guess, and turn up on time. Any any reason why there was less? Um, I'm not sure. Well, we'll, we'll put that to officials. Um, uh, there, I, I don't think I don't think it came up as a conscious issue, was it, as to whether the committee size be nine or eleven? But uh, let me know if what what how, no. how we got to that. We were guided by um, by your decisions in your office, um, Mr. Mayor. So okay. we didn't make make any decisions from a staff perspective on the numbers. Yeah, Council, I'm reasonably flexible on that. If there were other people that wanted to go on regulatory, maybe we could just see how it went. Let, let's give it a try just and like to be open to adding more yeah. if it's not working out. Yeah, no, no, absolutely open to that. There's there's no specific reason why um, it needs to be nine as against two eleven, uh, to the best of my knowledge. Um, Councillor Walker. Yeah. I, I actually think we probably had a, uh, an additional member or two members who um, uh, requested to come off that committee is probably the short answer, uh, Councillor. But if you are having problems with a quorum, let's come back to it and we may need to seek councillors prepared to take on that extra workload. Um, Councillor Darby. Just checking on the bi-monthly meetings that are identified here, finance, um, environment and climate change and the PACE Plus committee. Um, um, so when, you, when we identify in the terms of reference that there is uh, the bi-monthly meetings, does that mean any extra meeting is identified as an, and considered as an extraordinary meeting? Or you can still add, if, if, if um, the demands of, say, um, environment and climate change 
say that we really need an extra meeting in there, are they then identified as extraordinary meetings, or is it there's, there's parameters there to just plug it in? It depends on the ability to fulfil the notice requirements, basically, in the Act. Um, if it's something that crops up kind of urgently and at the last minute, then it might not be possible to fulfil the uh, notice requirements, so it'd be called as an extraordinary meeting. But um, if it's set ahead of time, um, then I, I, that could probably be deemed to be an ordinary meeting. Okay, so just in identifying them as bi-monthlies here and taking that into account, uh, the staff, I gather, are comfortable that we're not constraining ourselves. I just want to check that, really. Yeah. Um, I think it will be a, a matter of um, also how the committees are run and whether they're, they're run, you know, quite at pace. Uh, and... Um, um, and the, the decisions that are being made about the, the length of the, of the working days will, will have an impact on it. But it will be, you know, obviously it can be reviewed at any time if it proves to be really too busy on a bi monthly basis. Yeah, we, we did seek advice on that, councillor, and the advice from officials was that, yeah, we, we could manage it on that basis. We're trying to not to overload councillors with more and more meetings, but it's always that challenge between, uh, if you put it crudely, it would be between democracy and efficiency. Um, the chair will often want to hurry things along, and everybody also wants to have a say on an issue. So um, I just think we've got to be mindful uh, ourselves of, you know, before we take a call, do we really need to make that call or has it already been said? That, that sort of thing. So the, the solution's in our own hands. But if we needed more, again, you know, with any structure, uh, you set it up, you set it up after doing the right research, but you then test it against the practicality of how it's working. And if there are lessons to be learned and changes to be made, uh, we'll make them. Okay, uh, Councillor Newman. Good morning. Uh, the reporting committee, CCO um, oversight committee, um, the approval of the statement of intent, the monitoring of the uh, quarterly and half year and the annuals. Um, we do that on a quarterly basis. This is meeting monthly. So what are we doing in between the times when we're doing that uh, quarterly oversight work? Yeah, uh, I, th I think the answer to that, uh, if you recall back to the meeting last week, um, one or two councillors made a, a, a reasonable point that if we could stagger the meetings, the reporting, so that we weren't hearing from all the CCOs on one day, that would be better. And, uh, you know, I, I think what we'd be trying to do there is to break up the quarterly reporting so that it might be set out over, over two meetings. Is that for the quarterly, and, and is that is that for the performance report thing on the last quarter? I mean, I, I can I can understand that that would be a sensible thing to do. The issue would be the timing of it, because what you don't want to be doing is is getting a quarterly report that's so late that the issues become stale. Um, you need to ensure that the last quarterly report is presented in a timely way, so that there is input to ensure that we are reflecting back to the board and the governance, governing, uh, the senior governance of the um, senior management of the CCOs. So can that be done at next month's meeting or is it basically a situation whereby the CCO monitoring committee might have to be meeting possibly over two or three, two days uh, in the same month to ensure that the quarterly reports are all addressed in a timely manner? Uh, I accept that's the point, um, and you don't want to sit on a quarterly report for a, for a month before you get to it. Um, and it may be that there can be some flexibility around the timing of meetings, as, as with any of our meetings. You know, sometimes we have a very light agenda on some of the meetings, and the meeting will take uh, 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 no time at all, or, or the meeting uh, with the agreement of the members uh, uh, could, could be cancelled. Uh, at other times, however, you might find that uh, you need to, to meet more frequently without waiting for that time delay. Um, and so we should try and have some flexibility around that. Um, the CCO Oversight Committee is a new committee 
and it may be that members will want specific issues to be addressed that don't simply relate to a quarterly report. There may be an issue that comes up with a CCO where uh, a member of the committee or the chair of that committee or the deputy chair might say, hey, let's, um, let's use this meeting to delve more closely uh, into the uh, the, the question of what the CCO is intending to do on this subject. So um, without wanting to create work for you, the idea of the Oversight Committee is that you do have that flexibility to, to bring people in. So it's not just the CCO's meeting with the Mayor uh, quarterly, but appearing before a committee when there's an issue pertinent to that committee uh, that the committee may wish to examine the CCO more closely on. Uh, but it, there may be some comments from staff members um, particularly around timing. Um, obviously, the ability to stagger is, a, is, uh, is agreed, um, but the timing, whether you wait a month before you, um, you, 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 list, you have the quarterly report made to the committee. Do you have any thoughts on that? Um, through you, Mr Chair, I think it will be up to you, but when we were talking about this committee, and this is reflected in the last bullet point under key responsibilities, um, we were going to try to uh, develop a work program which has a, um, a schedule that tries to, to um, strike a balance. So um, just maybe, yes, wait for a month for, for some quarterly reporting so that you can have a um, more even workload. Mm -hmm we would presumably still get the quarterly report at the time that it was delivered to us individually. Um, so if there were pressing issues, um, then you'd deal with that as a priority in the first meeting. If it was a routine report, and Councillor, a lot of those reports are pretty routine, um, you, you might be able to afford to wait. But I, I think it'll be, a, I think it'll be a, a, a trial process on that. Okay, Councillor. Oh, sorry, you've got a supplementary, Councillor? I mean, the point, and I think you understand this, um, Your Worship, is that the nature of the work here under the key responsibilities is quite lumpy. Um, and um, it is important for us to be able to have timely access to the senior management and the boards of the CCOs as a committee of the whole. Um, and I would assume that the chair of the committee will work to ensure that we can have access on that basis. Yeah, you'll, you'll both have the report and I think the chair will uh, look at it together with the, the deputy chair and say, OK, these are the ones that we need to do as a priority. These, there are some pressing issues here or this is a routine report. If it, uh, if it needs to be left till next month, uh, there won't be any issues around that. But the uh, officers will work with the chair and the deputy chair um, to, to get a workload that, as uh, Margarita said, um, uh, really strikes the balance so that you're not overloaded at one meeting with nothing to do on other meetings. Okay, uh, Councillor Walker. Well, so I've got um, two or three questions. Uh, the first question is is just around the shift to uh, bi-monthly meeting and the, uh, the context around the uh, question is is around how we're going to manage the business of the council and what forecasting has been done around issues, issues, for example, that we already have in train, issues that we know that are coming up, the opportunity for public input on a timely basis, because quite obviously issues are going to come up um, publicly and for many people in the community waiting for two months, uh, maybe two months too long, and it may well be that in a bi-monthly situation, there may be simply enough, to, not enough time for public input, and I'm mindful of input on the part of uh, local boards as well. So I'd, I'd just like to have some assurance as to how this, um, how the structure and, and timing is going to work practically for the community, and conceivably also for councillors, because there may be issues that me, we may need to raise that don't fit within this. Uh, Your Worship and Councillors, um, just to point out that uh, for cases of real emergency, all of the committees of the whole, the key ones, um, have the delegation. The committee has the powers to perform the responsibilities of another committee where it's necessary to make a decision 
prior to the next meeting of that committee. So something really urgent can be considered by the next upcoming committee of the whole. I can take that point. Obviously, that got rather messy in the last uh, term of council, but um, let's not go there. The other question I've got um, just goes to a couple of um, particular issues. And uh, one is around um, um, stadiums. Um, so where are issues around um, stadiums going to go to? And I'm um, referring particularly to the RFA-controlled stadiums. Um, well, well, officials are thinking about the answer to that question. Um, the stadiums could well come under the CCO Oversight Committee because RFA okay. will be appearing before them. Um, and that uh, is probably um, where I would imagine that it would go to. But um, uh, okay, so uh, just, 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 just hold, just hold on to that it. thought, and if there's any any adjustment to my thinking on it from an officer's uh, well, if I know. if I add some more context, um, quite obviously there are the stadiums that are under RFA, but then there are a number of other stadiums that aren't under RFA, but which are also stadiums. Then there's the matter of cultural assets, of which, for example, there's the zoo and the art gallery, which are under RFA. But then there are many other cultural assets that aren't under RFA, for example. Um, and I'm just dealing with um, stadiums and some cultural assets. So it isn't clear to me. If it's not clear to me, quite clearly, it's not going to be clear to people in the community as well. And we need real clarity, particularly when there are issues of contention around these issues. Well, um, obviously the PACE Committee deals with sports activities and also arts and culture, so if they're not RFA and they're not covered by RFA, that's where they'd go to. OK, Councillor Fletcher. Uh, it's working now. Uh, trying to accommodate uh, our paperless system and it's difficult sometimes flicking from one to the other. Firstly, can, can I congratulate you. I think if there was one thing that came out of the election campaign, it was a desire for there to be more oversight on the CCOs. So I certainly welcome um, the inclusion of this committee um, in the work of councillors. And I, and I also think it's helpful that all councillors, you know, it is literally a cow. It's, it's a committee of the whole. So that, that is something that I, um, I welcome, and I think the Chair will, will do an excellent job in trying to better meet the expectations that the public have for our CCOs. My question relates to the um, interface between the Appointments Committee, um, which has under the delegations, which we'll discuss shortly, approve policies relating to the appointment of directors, um, all, all policies, the appointment of directors and trustees for CCOs and COs. Um, where the work uh, has, in the last term of council, begun to do regular performance um, of directors and chairs, uh, I'm assuming that that work will continue to sit under the Appointments Committee, but it's trying to understand that correlation between the, the performance of directors on our CCOs and um, the, the, the outcomes which are, are heading uh, to the CCO committee. So um, maybe it can't be resolved today, but I'm, I'm interested in your take on how, how that's going to work, that um, at what point do you identify that there might be a problem uh, in terms of performance on against measures against the um, SOIs and uh, how that then feeds back into the uh, performance of directors and any recommendations that might be coming. So is it intended that there will be a regular report from Councillor Cashmore as, as the chair of that committee to the appointments committee? Uh, or how do you see that occurring? I think uh, the advantage that everybody on the appointment and performance review committee is also on the CCO oversight committee and uh, the chair of the CC Oversight Committee is on appointments and performance review. Um, I think that, um, as you'll understand better than m many councillors having been deputy chair of that committee, um, using the expertise of that committee to determine uh, the appropriateness of director appointments and in a smaller uh, group than, say, um, uh, 21 of us uh, is, a, is a real advantage. 
But we've also uh, put up as part of the terms of reference, the draft terms of reference so far for the uh, independent review of CCOs to look at the criteria that we are appointing directors on to see if that's appropriate. And I think somebody having an outside view of that and saying, actually, no, you know, despite the fact we've worked really hard to get to those, um, those criteria, they might say, no, you've got the balance wrong. And I think that will be, that will be a useful part, I hope will be a useful part uh, from the report of the, uh, the independent panel. And, and that, is a, that is a very important piece of work. Um, my question relates more so though, having made the appointment, it's the ongoing monitoring of the performance of those individual directors and chairs. And so um, do you see that piece of work um, or the detail around that being something that will come out of the independent review? Or is that something that we should consider at this time in terms of the terms of reference to make it quite clear um, around that ongoing monitoring? Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm God forbid, but you know, we, we, we appoint a director that may not turn up on a regular basis, that may only stay for a short period of, of the board meeting, that may be um, unable to work as a team. Uh, th these sorts of things, you can often have some very fine people that work as individuals but may not be suited uh, to a council controlled organisation, but on paper they, they might appear to be a good fit. Mm -hmm. So it's just where we have those occasional instances mm -hmm. uh, where there are directors that are yep. not fulfilling yep. their, their duties and obligations. Uh, in the first instance, that's going to be a responsibility of the chair uh, of the board because what we are not wanting to do as a council is to constantly interfere with. Uh, how that board is operating. We think we'd be in all sorts of trouble if we did that. And the chair has a clear responsibility to ensure the performance of his or her um, fellow directors. Uh, secondly, as you're also aware, we, we are getting reports now from the boards who do get independent review of performance of directors. And that will be important, I think, to come back to APR. So we have that sort of oversight. So it's a balance between uh, not being a busybody and interfering constantly, but holding the chair accountable for the performance of the directors of each board, and then getting the report back from, uh, usually done by an independent agency, to say, this is how your directors are performing. So I think there are mechanisms there, and we, we just need to observe that, and you've got to have some confidence that the agency um, is doing an independent job, and it's not there simply to tick off, you know, which is always a suspicion uh, that you have. Um, but uh, if, the, if the system has integrity in terms of those performance reviews, we'll look at that, and where somebody is underperforming, they either need professional training or they need to go. Well, I certainly see this as a step in the right direction and I hope will improve the governance um, of our CCOs. So congratulations on Thank taking you, the step. Uh, Deputy Mayor Cashmore. Mayor, and I'd like to thank Daniel, um, Councillor Newman, for his, for his question and comment because it's, it brings up a very important point. The CCO committee, as a committee of a whole, is, is, is relatively new in the context that there's also a panel reviewing this work and the fact that we are 10 years young in the process. So I'd just like to give all councillors absolute clarity and confirmation that we will be developing a work program with you, the program together, and then that work program will be on each agenda item each month so that people have an ongoing degree of transparency of what's being done and what we're coming up with. And it gives iterative, so as things move, we will have the flexibility to change with it. This is a process that we developed with audit and risk and with strategic procurement, and it seems to have worked quite well that everyone's directly involved. So I want to make it inclusive as we can, Mr Mayor. Thank you very much, uh, Deputy Mayor. Councillor Casey, last comment, I think. That In signing off these recommendations, you... Um, bestow upon me the overlordship of the panels again, for which I am very grateful. But I'd also like to say thank you to the councillors who have volunteered to be the liaison councillor for each of them. And Councillor Bartley's taken up the disability panel, Councillor Young, the ethnic panel, 
Councillor Collins, thank you, the Pacific panel. Councillor Hills, who's having his cup of tea, the Rainbow panel. And new councillors, I'm particularly grateful to Councillor Tracy Mulholland, who's not here today, who's going to be the wonderful new Seniors. liaison council for seniors. And Councillor Shane Henderson, youth. What age are you again? The Don't... youngest. You're the youngest councillor <laughs> in the room? <laughs> By six yeah. months. You, you, youth adjacent rather than uh, youth, I think. <laughs> and I also think the mayor has made an inspired choice in placing Councillor Alfie in charge of the Parks, Arts, Community and Events Committee. And I'm looking forward very much to working with them over the next three years. Thank you very much, councillor. If there's no further comments, um, I'll... Uh, oh, sorry, uh, councillor Walker. Uh, Wayne, can you put your mic on, please? Around the matter of the um, various um, advisory panels, and I did raise the importance of environment, and obviously climate change is, is right up there. Has, has the Mayor or officers given any thought into how we might involve the public more and various expert groups in terms of advising us around that issue, those issues? Yeah. Shall I have the first go, and you can uh, you can sweep up afterwards? Um, I th I think it's important. In fact, it's critical that there is uh, a wider involvement of community groups uh, and uh, NGOs in in the task that we have in front of us. Uh, clearly, climate change has been given uh, greater uh, preeminence. It's the, probably the key reason why we split uh, the environment from environment and community and why we put climate change into that title. It, it acknowledges the importance of it. Uh, what we do, I mean, we're currently looking at the, uh, the climate framework uh, uh, submissions that have been put in. Uh, there is an advisory group there. Uh, I'm not very happy with the, um, the level of um, awareness of that advisory group. I think they, they, they need to be more prominent. Um, and this committee will have probably as its critical role, uh, what are the priorities for us to act to reduce carbon emissions, and then as a second uh, string to the bow is what are the actions that we need to take to adapt to climate change. Both of those will involve close interaction with the public. Now, the actual mechanisms we use, I think we'll experiment with as the conversation you and I have had uh, as, as we go along. Uh, but is it critical that the public not only have input in, but a sense of ownership over what we're doing, and the answer to that is yes. Uh, if there were to be costs associated with the actions that we have to take, then clearly the public have got to feel that they have had a role in determining what priorities we've taken and how we've acted on them. So more than any other issue before this uh, governing body, uh, that interaction with the public uh, and all aspects of the public, including the young people who have been so vocal on it, I think are really important. Uh, is there anything else that officers would like to add to that? Okay. Right, uh, I'll put the motion then. All those in favour, please say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. 